So, Derek Daly is one of the few Irishmen ever to race in Formula One, a veteran of 64 Grand Prix in the early 80s, and I'm delighted that he's in studio alongside me. How are you? Great, I'm good. Great to be back. You're based in America now, you're in Indianapolis, but you're back home for the weekend. Yeah, went to Indianapolis 1983, just for curiosity, the race of the Indy 500, never left. Life just sort of happened from day to day. Indianapolis, the home of motorsport in America uh, these days? They call it the home of the greatest spectacle in racing, the Indy 500, 500, which still is the biggest motorsports event in the world today. What sort of crowds did it get? Uh, race day is about 300,000. <sighs> Um, when I went there, first qualifying day, believe it or not, the first day of qualifying, just to see cars by themselves do four laps, would draw 120,000 people. At that stage, it was the second largest single day attendance sports event in the world, hmm. next to race day, so it was just huge. Yeah, it isn't saying the popularity still of motorsport. Maybe it's in this part of the world because it's gone behind the paywall on Sky Sports. Formula One certainly isn't in everybody's front room yeah. every Sunday, but even watching the British Grand Prix last month, you're looking at the Saturday morning practice and the grandstands are full from 9 o'clock in the morning. Amazingly, Formula One statistically is still the largest or the second largest, depending on what metrics you use to look at soccer, mm. sport sports platform in the world. Now, the middle tiers, the junior levels have, have fallen off a little bit because the general interest of teenagers, etc., these days, you know, has gone off in a variety of different, uh, different avenues. But Formula One and the Indy 500 have maintained their stature as just mega sports events. So you're back home for a couple of reasons. You were going to be in Mondello Park. You've got your 81... Formula One car? 81 Guinness-sponsored March Formula One car that we brought in 1981 to demo at Mondello. Uh, a friend of mine now owns it. He's from Cork, lives in uh, New York and New Jersey, and um, just loves to, to be in a position to give back to Mondello and to the Irish sports scene in general. Is it drivable? It is drivable, and we will run it. Yeah. What's, what's its current top speed? Oh, well, I mean, it'll do, it'll do what it did back in the day, 190 miles an hour. Now, not at Mondello. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to expect anybody... Would you be comfortable driving it at 190 miles an hour? No, and I declined the offer. I said, look, if we're going to do this and we're going to help the next generations of young drivers, A, to get interested in the sport, we have to pick some of the young drivers and put them in it. Right. So James Rowe from NACE, um, um, Jordan Dempsey current drivers being supported by Team Ireland financially to try and help them live their dream. We're going to put them in it, give them a sample of what a Formula One car looks like and feels like and sounds like. And, you know, maybe it'll be just to, you know, rekindle their interest in, in, in doing whatever is necessary. But really, if we can capture the imagination of a 12-year-old looking mm. over the fence. That's exactly what happened to me in Dunboyne when I was 12 and my dad took me to see a racing car for the first time. I can remember the smell and the noise and the colour and the speed and it influenced my life that that was what I was going to do. And so maybe we'll influence some 12-year-old boy, girl that's there that says, ah, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that someday. And we want to tell them it's possible. Is it possible? If you look at a 12, 15, 18-year-old in Ireland, is it possible for them to, you can always dream, but is it possible realistically to think that they can drive Formula One? Because certainly looking at it from afar, it feels as though more and more Formula One is becoming for the rich. That right. unless you have money to start, you have no way of getting in. And so I believed that exact um, um, scenario when I was 12 and 13. Formula One looked so far off in the distance mm -hmm. and they were superstars on a different planet. And I decided that at least I'm going to go as far as I can possibly go. Now, this sport is driven by success. When you get support from people, you have to deliver on the racetrack or else the support runs out. So I truly believe still that world-class driving talent, 
if it has the desire and the commitment to make the sacrifices necessary. You get industry support and, and outside support from friends, family, etc., who will try and keep you on track. If you start winning races, and, and you have to win races, mm. you start winning races, I believe it is possible today to, to make it all the way to Formula One. But it is one of the most difficult sports in the world to succeed in because you are challenged. People tell me, if you want to learn about life, go in the military. I say, you want to learn about life, go into motor racing because it challenge you, challenges people physically, mentally and emotionally every single day and you can't hide anything. Has the skill set changed when you look at young drivers now to what you had and it was a real hotbed around South Dublin which we'll get into some of those you grew up with. When you look at the skill set of young drivers yeah. in the 70s and 80s and what was needed then to become a Formula 1 driver when there wasn't quite the level of technology do you need a different type of type of driver these days? No, I don't believe the skill set has changed. What has changed is the age has come down. Because back in our day, we didn't have managers or coaches or simulators or all the things that they have now available to them to prepare them for when they do get the chance. So we had to learn by the seat of our pants, yeah, as you call you it. You earned your corn and you right. put the miles in. Exactly. Nowadays, the age has come down so much because... Think about it. In my day, I started when I was 16, driving stock cars in Santry. Today, I'd be at least 10 years too late because kids are racing go-karts at five and six years of age. So what's available to, the, to them today trains them and prepares them at a much earlier level to perform at a much higher level sooner. Mm. But the skill sets are still the same. The mental pressure is still the same, if not more, because the consequences are more dire, because now you have global television that watches every single move you make, and you can't hide the mistakes. A mistake is seen around the world, and you are nailed to the wall when you make a mistake. So the mental pressure might be more, but the general driving skills, I'd say, will be the same. You might have got lucky back in the day, and there might have been a camera on the corner that you crashed out on, right. whereas nowadays... There's a fair few cameras around <laughs> some of the accidents I had. Yeah. <laughs> so... Go back then, you grew up around Dundrum, Ballantyr, that area, mm. which was, as I say, a real hotbed of talent yeah. for Irish racing. Eddie Jordan, David Kennedy. Bernard Devaney. Why was that? There's, there's no reason, really. I mean, I met David Kennedy when he was on a 250 Bull Taco. Everything was painted black, and I got to know him, and we just started to talk. And, oh, you're interested in racing? Yeah, so am I. Really, yeah. What would you think of doing? Oh, well, I'm thinking of buying a Formula Ford, David said to me. You are? That's possible? Yeah, but I don't have any money. <laughs> and so then we were introduced to Bernard Devaney. The only reason we, we got to know him is his dad had a, a, a petrol station over in Rathfarnham. And so we got to know him, and he was interested. And then we met Eddie Jordan, who was, you know, the typical shyster, deal maker, you know, and he had a Formula Ford that was for sale. And I thought, well, I could buy that maybe. And so it was a stretch to buy it because it was 400 pounds back in those days. And then David said, well, why don't we go and, and do something in the winter uh, that'll make us a chunk of money? So we went off to the iron ore mines of Australia. What age are you? I'm now uh, 20. And where have you learned to drive? On, on, the, on, on the roads around Dundrum. We had no formal training, nothing. No coaches. You jumped in and you just learned the hard way. And it was the hard way for us. But back in those days, the model was different. So you were racing against people coming up with a similar model. People didn't have big transporters and engineers and data and electronics and all the stuff they have now. So you are racing against like-minded people with similar equipment. So you could be competitive if you got your act together quick enough. And how quickly from that initial day in Dumboin with your dad watching and smelling it and the love quickly being nurtured, how quickly do you go from that to becoming obsessed and looking and thinking about Formula One. Okay, so obsessed is an interesting word because I do seminars based on the book that I wrote about the skills needed to succeed. And one of the things I say time and time again is you better be obsessed with success and obsessed with getting the better, best from yourself because it's so challenging. The car breaks, the, you have an accident, you need new tires, you need all the stuff that you can't afford. And so the sacrifice you have to make, and quite frankly, your family makes, because they're the early investors in your career. 
So it's it's hard to do it, but but I think what drove me was having a job, having a regular job. It, it never entered my head because it was going to take too much time out of my day. Like, if you had a regular job, then you couldn't dedicate your time to racing. And so I was, I was, I was of the firm belief that if you don't put the big effort in, you won't know how far you can go, and go as far as you can go, and then you can go and get a job later on. I mean, that was sort of the mindset. And how did that mindset fit in with life at home and your parents and their attitude? Believe it or not, my parents were 100% supportive of my racing career and they knew nothing about the sport. I had never seen a racing car before. The first racing car my dad saw was the first day I saw my first one. And so I was lucky in a so way... So that was just potluck? Your dad wasn't a petrol head? No, not in any way. He sold groceries out of a corner store in, in, in Wickham Park in Dundrum. And one of the ladies who came in was the sister of Sidney Taylor. Sidney Taylor had a racing car in England. He was bringing it to Dunboyne and he happened to park it two roads over from where we lived. And I saw the big van racing team. I mean, it was just, it was just happenstance that I even became aware of it. You were obviously willing to do whatever was necessary then if you're going over to the mines in mm -hmm. Australia for the winter. Is that an enjoyable time, or is that again just the time of? So I tell people incredible focus of as a laborer, as a laborer in the, in the dirt and heat of Northwest Australia. I tell people it was the dirtiest, hardest, hottest, most enjoyable thing I'd ever done in my life up, up until that time. And every uh, second Friday, we would open our pay packet, be all stained in red iron ore dust, and you'd look down to the hours. How many hours did I put in? Remember, you got. Uh, single time for the first eight hours, double time for the next eight hours, and if you could work 24 hours straight, you got triple time. How often did you do that? As, as often as we could, yeah. And so we came back from Australia, myself and David, with £5,000, which was more than money than I'd ever seen at that time. <laughs> yeah. We were well able to afford Eddie Jordan's car. Paid Eddie Jordan off. Suddenly I had a racing car, and away I went to Mondello Park, and the rocket ship just absolutely took off. Well, talk to us about it taking off then. What's the process from going from there, from Mondello Park, to eventually so I buy a making second your Formula hand, 1 debut in, what was it, 78? I buy my, yeah, I buy my second uh, Formula Ford from a friend of mine, Gary Gibson, in, in Belfast. Now, it was a good car, very good car. I could lead races, but finish second. I could never quite win. And um, I crashed it at Mondello in June of 75, um, uh, rolled it over, smashed to pieces, thought, well, it's over now, all the money's gone, now the car's gone, so the career's mm. essentially over. I was sitting in the paddock with David Kennedy, this older guy in a, one of those old hunting, greasy jacket things walked up to me and says, if you can get, raise enough money to buy a brand new engine, we'll take the car that smashed here on the trailer and give you a brand new one. He says, by the way, my name is John Crosley, we build these cars in Belfast. The heavens opened again. Here I was, golden opportunity. I went and borrowed the money from David Kennedy, bought the engine, sent it up. There was 11 more races in the championship. I was on, a, on the pole 11 times, won 11 races, won the championship, and then I said, I'm off to England. A lot of what you're talking about is having money at the right time and needing it to tape those steps along the ladder. The craft of driving. Where did you learn that? Who did you admire? Was it po could you talk to drivers a step ahead of you who would pass on tips? Yes, um, but essentially Mondello Park became the training ground. Mondello Park was a, a tight, twisty, difficult, hard to understand, very technical track. But we didn't know at the time. We were just, that was it. We thought that was a racing track. But it prepared us so well to go to Silverstone, to go to Brands Hatch, to go other places in England. And so the Irish group of David Kennedy, myself and Bernard, when we went, and Eddie Jordan, when we went to England, we started to win immediately. And so we were even surprised, because hmm. we expect to go to England, oh, you know, they're better than us. We started to win there. And so suddenly the British manufacturers started to want to help us Oh, we'll give you the latest trick stuff for cars, because if you're going to win an hour car, we'll sell more cars. And so suddenly the momentum began to take off in England too. And when did Formula One arrive then? So 1976, James Hunt won the World Championship. A classic duel with Nicky Lauda. The Formula Ford Festival, which is at Brands Hatch, 150 drivers from around the world all descended upon Brands Hatch, and it was a shootout. 
That year they called it Tribute to James. James Hunt was there to present the trophy to the winner. I happened to dominate in the rain, practice, qualifying, heat, semi-final, won the final. James Hunt hands me the trophy, 1976. Two years later, I was on the Formula One grid beside him, l- looking over and thinking, hey, remember, remember, <laughs> remember me? me? It was an unbelievable rise. So I went from Formula Ford winning the festival to testing a Formula One car in 13 months. Wow. Today, it's still the record. No one's ever gone from Formula Ford to Formula One faster than I did back in 76. And were you ready for it? Well, I would say no. Because I got there so fast, I didn't really understand the skills necessary to stay there. I really didn't have the mental capacity, I think, to work it all out and understand it. You were driving on your wits and on your instincts and reflexes, which means if you weren't fast enough, you drove harder. And if you drove harder and you still weren't fast enough, you drove even harder until you flew off the road. Right. And so now, having got to the very top, it was harder to stay there. And believe it or not, the difficulty I had in Formula One, because I was only there five years. After five years, I went to America to do IndyCars. The difficulty I had became a tremendous platform of education for my book, And so now, coming back to Mondello, I created this seminar that I've done many, many times in America, purely to try and give back to the young drivers, because I know Motorsports Ireland is now set up here to try and nurture this young generation that's got a bit lost, isn't as isn't as polarized with the sport as we all were, Um, but Motorsports Ireland recognizes and says, hey. If we want to build our sport back again in our own country, we have to capture the young guys. And so for me to be able to give back because of the lessons I learned, it's, it's the most natural thing that I should do. When you do look back now, 40 years on... 40 years, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Could you have done anything differently? Like, at the time, I presume it's just a whirlwind. You're thrown into whirlwind. Formula One. Was, oh. it, was it the glitz and the glamour? I, back I, then live, I was now? living in Monaco. 1980, 81, 82. I'm now 25. Yeah. So you don't really want to say stop. You right. don't want to go, yeah. you know what, my just pause and think My about apartment what I had a better. rooftop garden that overlooked the harbour at Monaco. I mean, come on. Do you think I needed a lesson? <laughs> you think I needed anyone to tell me what to do? And of course, then I cartwheeled into the first corner, one of the most famous ac- accidents in Monaco in 1980, mm. in the Candy Tyrrell. Because Still, you had led, you mentioned being on the grid with James Hunt. You had led your first Grand Prix? First Formula One race was the International Trophy at Silverstone in the rain, and I led it. Could, could have won it, except my visor broke halfway through while I'm leading it. It's pissing down rain, and I can hardly see, and yet I wouldn't stop. I was changing gear, holding my visor up with, with one hand, changing gear again. Oh, no. But it was, it was an amazing, an amazing time. So where did you think you were then in those first couple of years? Did you think you were destined to win a driver's championship, destined to win races? Well, when I signed my contract with Williams in 82, um, uh, the cheek of me to ask him, what would the bonus be if I won the World Championship? <laughs> and what did he say? <laughs> he says, if you win the World Championship, you won't need a bonus from me. You'll be fine. Yeah. It was obviously an incredibly dangerous time for Formula One as well. There were four deaths in your yeah. time in Formula One. Gilles Villeneuve, probably the most yeah. high profile. but. Ronnie Pedersen's death, the Swedish oh, driver. Yeah, my second Grand Prix. Monza. Second ever Grand Prix. Yeah. You're involved in that crash. Yeah. You try and pull him out of the car. Yeah, and he was such a hero of mine because he had such flair and personality in a car. What uh, happened? Uh, run to the first corner of Monza, big melee, funnel down. James Hunt hits, Ronnie Peterson spins, and he goes to the inside, hits the wall. It was in the Lotus 78 when it had side fuel tanks. And of course, the side fuel tanks full of fuel exploded immediately. Car was so oh, badly damaged, and I, I'm only you know two or three rows behind. So, uh, Carlos Reutemann in the Ferrari starts to spin. I try to miss him. He hits me. I spin, jump out of the car, look back, and it looked like an airline accident. The whole racetrack was on fire. I run back, and Hunt was there. Pironi was there. Regazzoni, myself, and Marzario, and we're all gathered around thinking. We, ha- we have to get him out of the car. 
And I can remember so clearly, I was so afraid. My heart was pounding through my chest so much. The temples were pounding on the side of my head. I could barely see straight and get a focus. I was so scared and so afraid. And so you're around this flaming mass of destruction trying to, how can you get in? And Hunt goes in and undoes his belt and out of the flames he throws him right at, the, at, at my feet. And I could see his legs were very badly damaged because they looked like a rag doll. But he lifted his arm and he lifted lifted his visor and we thought, ah, oh, he's alive. He's gonna live. It's okay, yeah. And so you walk back through the destruction, they try to start to clear it up, the ambulance arrives, the helicopter arrives, walk back and when I began to tell my wife at the time and my family, you know, what I'd just seen, I began to cry. Because, you, you know, you just, I, I never experienced, you're forced into Shock these. Shock as much as Yeah, well, else. exactly, yeah. And you're forced into these experiences without any formal training. And so about 45 minutes after um, I get back to the pits, you know, we're still sitting there in a huddle, you're still sort of trying to get over it. My team manager at the time, Mo Nunn, who owned the Ensign team, taps me on the shoulder and says, the race is going to restart in 20 minutes, spare cars ready, pull yourself together. 20 minutes after witnessing this, after yeah. having to pull yeah. Pedersen out of the car. I got, I got a helmet on. Get back in the car in the spare car, get strapped on, we line up and away we go. And I finished tenth, my best ever result. Isn't that amazing? The mental capacity that you have to have to block out something you've just seen. Mm. And can you remember what you were like mentally when you got back in the car for the rest of that race? No, you just completely close the world out and go into a selfish focus mode. And of course, Peterson died that night. We get the word that he's dead as we're packing our bags to head off to Watkins Glen in Australia, in, in America for the next Grand Prix. You, you, you move How on. does that affect you? Well, you didn't allow it to affect you. But it must have, it must lie back there somewhere. But, but you just move on, you move on. And, and, and not too long after that, Villeneuve gets killed. I'm with him two days, because I, I live in a Monaco at the time, I meet him down in the, in the sea front, mm. And he's walking along with Joanne, his wife, and his, his two kids. One is Jacques, who goes on to become world champion. champion as well, yeah. And he's lived at what Pironi did five days earlier at Imola and said he'd never speak to him again because Pironi jumped a team orders and won the race when Villeneuve was leading. And Villeneuve goes to Zalder the next day and says, I'll show you. And he did show him, tried too hard in qualifying and, and, and was killed. It's an incredible level of camaraderie clearly among the drivers that James Hunt, who's an international superstar, yeah. all the drivers who are involved in that crash with Peterson, mm. they don't have any thought for their own safety. It's just, we need to try and save this man. Yeah, 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 as best you can. But, but the, the sport was just about to go through. I was right in the middle of this new era of ground effects. Suddenly there was massive downforce. Turbocharged engines came in and we went from 600 horsepower to 1500 horsepower. And so the danger level went up, but the, the, the racing circuits were, were not able to cope with it. Mm. Um, uh, you stress the car more because you're going so much faster. Elio De Angelis, my teammate in Formula 2, testing at Paul Ricard in the Brab on the rear wing brakes. He flies off the road, upside down, car goes on fire. No physical injuries except a broken shoulder blade and he dies because they, they can't get to him quick enough and the car burns and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he's, and he's killed. You know, and, and Brabham simply get another driver for the car as soon as possible because the contract says you have to pre run two cars in every Grand Prix. Were you ever afraid? I was never afraid until after the accident that I had in IndyCars in 1984. Because I got hurt so badly then. I, 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 I don't believe I was ever the same driver again. What were the injuries after the IndyCar crash? Oh, I had... Um, I mean, I broke everything up the left side. I had a toe traumatically amputated. I had crushed left ankle, bone grafting from my hip to rebuild it. Double compound fracture of the left leg, broken hip joint, broken pelvis, broken ribs, broken hand, broken arm, third degree burns, lacerated liver, blood transfusions, laced with hepatitis C. There must have been moments where they didn't think you'd survive. Uh, it, was the, it was the hardest crash impact that a driver had ever managed to survive at that time. So intensive care for the first 10 days. And so when you get, w w b until you get hurt, you're never quite sure mm. that, that 
that, that it would ever happen to you. you know, you'll escape. But when you get hurt that badly, now you're fully aware of the consequences. And although I was never as fast a driver afterwards, I might have been a better driver because you never quite ran to the ragged edge all the time, which means that you became protective of the equipment. But although you're not as fast, you're better because you think more about what you, what, what you'll do, what you do. Monaco is probably the track you're most associated with, and if right. you go on YouTube, it's mm. the track that will come up first for a couple of reasons. So there was the crash yeah. in 1980 mm. at the first corner, yeah. where you fly through the air, yeah. old style, yeah. and you survive. Yeah. What, what are you like? Can you remember that? I, I remember every, vividly every millisecond of it in HD detail in my mind. I'm on the outside of the grid and I realize if I can get to the inside of Sandevote, it's a much safer place to be, to mm. go roll around the inside. Um, we, the, 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 the lights go out, off we go, there's screams of engines and I can, I can actually see leaves flutter through the air as I saw Petrezzi just get a bit away a bit lazy and I was trying to work out, I wonder is there a, enough room for me to slot in in front of him, get on the inside nice and safe. As I look over to make that determination, Giacomelli, who's on my left side, gets on the brakes. I look back, he's on the brakes, realize I can't brake that quick, I'm gonna hit him. And so the whole method of, I probably gonna hit him, I might break my front wing, I'll go straight to the pits, they'll have a new front wing, I'll come back on, race will go on, no, no big deal. But when I hit his rear tire, he was slowing down. My front wing, instead of bouncing back off and bounced up in the air, because his rear wheel was like a conveyor belt. And so when I landed, I landed back on his rear wheel. Now the conveyor belt winds my car right up until it stands on its nose. I now think I'm going to go upside down. I lay perfect focus on the pebbles in the road, afraid I'm going to land on the roll bar. I could get hurt. It didn't roll forward. It rolled sideways. Frost had just arrived in the McLaren. It rolled onto his rear wheel, which was like a trampoline. It went boing, and it rolled me another half cartwheel forward, landed right out of the air on top of my teammate Jarius' front wheel, which was another trampoline, boing, boing from the tires. So I did this two and a half cartwheels, and of course the television cameras captured everything in HD slow motion. So we relived it for years. Everything you've just described happened in a second and a half. Yeah, and I remember it as if it's in slow motion. And when the car does come to a halt, what's I realize, in your head? Is it I, relief? I, I get relief, a yeah. Frustration because there is that racist yeah, instinct of yeah. it's Monaco. Probably more frustration, yeah. yeah. And I'm hoping they'll stop the race. There's a lot of cars that crashed here. They'll stop the race. I can get in the spare car. Well, they didn't stop the race. The big crane came over, lifted the cars after the first lap away they went yeah it is incredible watching the footage because yeah. your car is still in the middle of the track yeah. there's yellow flags there's no red yeah. flags yeah. You're tr and they're all just weaving their yeah. way in past yeah. the first corner yeah. and your car is almost as part of the course now yeah yeah amazing yeah and then two years later I almost won it you're leading the Monaco Grand Prix into the final lap yeah about to start the last lap and you've lap. never had a podium up to this no leading the race and I could hear the gearbox beginning to make noise and eventually the gearbox breaks as I just go around the Raskas hairpin and never made the last lap. Finished sixth. How do you get over that? Like your entire well, career, uh, your entire life yeah. in a way is built up to this moment. Right, and if you look at the video, I, 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 the, the car pulls off. I literally stepped up, stepped onto the front of the car, onto the wall by the seafront and walked away and never looked back. And so I went into this sort of stunned silence where you know what happened, you, you understand it, you process it, but you don't want to believe it. Mm. So you don't want to talk to even yourself about it. Packed up my bags, walked, because I could walk to my apartment at the time, walked up these steps, and there's one street between Saint Devote, ironically. My, and my mother was there, by the way, at the time, looking at the race. Um, as I walked by the Ferrari dealer, there was a yellow Ferrari Dino 246 GT. I went back the next morning and bought it. <laughs> that was my own personal trophy for the disaster. So you're being well looked after, at least, during this time <laughs> in Formula One. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. You mentioned your mother there. During this time then, and there are all these deaths in Formula One, it's an incredibly dangerous sport to be right. involved in. What are your family like? Are they concerned for your safety or do they just know your personality that there's this drive within we you that they never can't stop? ever spoke about it. However, when I'm in the hospital in Indianapolis 
and both legs are in casts, they're in bandages that are blood covered every day. Uh, I can't get out of the bed um, because um, my left side is, is all broken. I'm in, I'm in the hospital room one day just thinking about nothing. I look over and my mother's standing in the doorway. I thought, how'd you get here? Because I was so heavily medicated, you know, it didn't, it didn't compute to me. Yeah. You know, where am I? She's there. She comes to look after me. She stays for six weeks, starts to take me to therapy. Then she went back home. And after about three months, she knew that I, I'd never had the conversation about, will I stop racing? And about three months after, I'm on the phone tour in Dublin. You know what she says to me? Do you have another drive lined up yet? I was completely floored because my mother knew that I never wanted the legacy to be the accident that leaving mm. the sport. So I had to get back to racing. She knew that. And despite the fears of, of a mother, she was so far behind me, so totally behind me. Do you have another drive lined up yet? That line of when you don't win the race in Monaco of you walk out of the car and you just never look back. Mm. Like that just seems to be racing drivers in a nutshell. Yeah, and you, you, you can't I, look back. I think you have to, part of, the, part of the slide that I use in the seminar is um, racing drivers like golfers have to learn the ability to forget. Because mm. if you don't forget, what happens? You're afraid, or if a golfer doesn't forget, what happens? He, he muffs the nef- next yeah. shot because he did it the last time and he can't get it out of his head. Yeah, it's the Jack Nicholas line of I've never three put in the final round of a major in the press conference. Someone goes, Well, what about this? He goes, I've never three put in the final <laughs> round of a major. <laughs> exactly. It's like he's just blanked it out. Yeah, can you learn the art of how to forget? Have you any regrets? Like 64 races, you never quite got that podium? No. It sounds never, like you're the yeah. time of your life. Yeah, yeah. And then go to America and get hurt, so never quite got there either. Um, but my, my, the road that I took led me to television broadcasting. Mm. I did an interview with ESPN about my accident in America that turned into a 10-year contract. Suddenly now they're paying me money to talk about the sport and travel the world. And so I'm racing and doing television broadcasting. So that opened up a whole other career for 23 years. And that career led me to keynote speaking because I would ask to, be asked to come and speak for corporations. Then they said, well, we'll pay you. And then the, the agency said, well, we'll represent you. So a third complete career happened because of the motor racing mm. platform. So yes, I'd, I, I wouldn't mind a redo over again, but, I'd ha- but, I, but I want to do it with what I know now, yeah. which is impossible. Just that so really at the there. end of the day, I don't have much to complain about because everything that I have in my life is because of that fateful day in Dunboyne of seeing a racing car, of the fact that Mondello Park happened to get built at the right time and we had access to learn and to train and that I met such great people along the way. And, and I mean, it's been a blast. It really has. So you've gone from probably worshipping James Hunt to competing alongside James yeah. Hunt to commentating on Ayrton Senna and the great drivers yeah. of that era to watching on now with Lewis Hamilton's domination. Yeah. The skill set for a Formula One driver over the last 30, 40 years, has it changed? I, I, I think it's different, but the, skill, the skills needed are the same. What's different is the cars are now more sophisticated and the window to be competitive is much, much smaller. Our day, the grid was covered by five or six seconds. Now it's covered by two, mm. one and a half sometimes. So the window to be successful is much smaller. The ability to make a small mistake has much more dire consequences in general. Not that you would get hurt. There's less chance to get hurt. But if you make a tiny mistake and lock the brake in the first corner of a Grand Prix today, you, may, you have automatically taken yourself out of a chance to be successful. And that's what's so different about the window these days. And people say, yes, it's predictable somewhat. But Do you enjoy watching it? Oh, yeah. I watch every race still. Every race. Every qualifying session. Do you find it predictable? Do you find it a bit dull? Uh, well, for me, I understand what it takes to operate mm. at that level. So in America, they say baseball is the most fascinating sport in the world. I think it's the most boring <laughs> thing you've ever watched. But I don't understand it. Yeah. I don't understand the strategy, etc. But I understand what it takes to operate at that level in Formula One. And so that's why it continues to be fascinating for me. You're over here then. You've mentioned the seminar you're giving in your book, A Champion's Path, where you talk about the skill set. 
that is needed it's impossible to know but where do you think we are in terms of having a, another Irish Formula 1 driver I think we're at the bottom of the trough we're, the, we're, we're in the middle of the void right now um, it's imperative that we we influence young people 12, 13, 14 um, and Luckily, Motorsports Ireland have recognised it. Now they've got the Junior Rally Academy. Mm. They've got Team Ireland that's, that's going after younger drivers and literally saying, you need to learn this skill, this skill and this skill. And they're able to attract an element of funding behind them. So that is so vitally important. Quite frankly, without those initiatives, we may never see another Irish Formula One driver. With that initiative, we have a chance. And if we have a chance... Really, that's all we need. And I believe if there is a supremely talented young Irish guy sitting out there, and if he shows world-class talent, I believe there's enough people in the network of motorsports in Ireland that will attach their networks that we can get him or her funded to at least give them the chance, Mm. the opportunity to show, are you good enough or are you not? Derek, it's been brilliant having you in studio. I suspect there's another half an hour at least in Derek Daly, right. the Monaco yeah. years. Oh, easy, easy. So many. I, I will write a book someday. Oh, yeah? I just, I, there's so many unbelievable stories. have to pass stories. it with the lawyers, I guess, first. Uh, no. How good was life in Monaco for those few years? It was interesting. <laughs> Leave it at that. Leave it at that. Derek Daly, cheers for A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.